Welcome to the first in a series of six sessions entitled Introduction to Orthodox Christianity. My uh, lecture notes are based on the book The Orthodox Church, the new edition 1997, that is written by Timothy Ware, known also as Bishop Kalistos Ware. The first three lectures, first three sessions, will cover the history of the church, and the second three lectures will cover faith and worship. So the series of six is divided into two parts. Part one, history, three sessions, and part two, faith and worship, three sessions. The first part concerning the history of the church is divided in the following manner. Session one, introduction and the beginnings. Byzantium I, the Church of the Seven Consuls, and Byzantium II, the Great Schism. That will be our topic for today. The second session, which will follow uh, next week, is entitled The Conversion of the Slavs, the Church under Islam, Moscow and St. Petersburg. And the third session that completes part one, the history of the church, We'll cover the 20th century, Greeks and Arabs, the 20th century, two, orthodoxy and the militant atheists, the 20th century, three, diaspora and mission. Now, the history of the Orthodox Church covers 2,000 years. 2,000 years. And so I'm going to paint the history of the Church with a very large brush, Big brush strokes. It will be impossible for me to cover all of the aspects of the history of the church. However, we will try to cover the major events in the history of orthodoxy. Part two, faith and worship, will cover holy tradition in the fourth section, the source of the orthodox faith, and God and humankind. The fifth session, We'll research the Church of God, Orthodox Worship 1, the earthly heaven, Orthodox Worship 2, the sacraments. And the final and sixth session, Orthodox Worship 3, feasts and fasts and private prayer, the Orthodox Church and the reunion of Christians. Orthodox history covering 2,000 years Orthodox faith and worship includes 20 volumes of worship books. 20 volumes. The original service books were written in Biblical Greek, the Hellenistic Greek of the first century. These books were later translated into Slavonic and then later into the vernacular languages of the people the most common usage within orthodoxy is the vernacular, that is the spoken language of the people, with the exceptions of the Greek and Russian churches that still use in their worship biblical or Hellenistic Greek or church Slavonic. And so we begin our history. When we speak about the history of the orthodox church, we can speak first about Christendom as having three major divisions occurring in three stages, if you will. Three divisions that occurred over three stages. And these stages are roughly divided in 500-year events. Uh, uh, For me, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to bring in to our community Deacon Kiriakos. I pushed for that because I really felt he had the calling and that the diaconate is a very important part of the church that unfortunately fell into disuse in the Greek archdiocese. But in the Russian Orthodox Church, um, I'm sure in the Romanian Orthodox Church, in the, uh, the, the Greek Orthodox Church of Antioch, very important. My father was a deacon for five years 
then he became a priest. So I grew up with the diaconate, and the diaconate is part and parcel. You read the Bible, go back to the text, that's what our, our Protestant friends would say, right? Go back, that's what the Reformation was all about, wasn't it? Go back to the text, go back to the Bible to find, the determine the doctrine of the church. In the Bible, there are three pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. They, all, they mention deacons, bishops, and presbyters. Okay? So from the early church, the diaconate was very important, extremely important. In the book of Acts, we have the ordination of the diaconate. Without the diaconate, the priests and bishops cannot do their work. They cannot preach and teach, which is their primary work, without the deacons. What is the job of the deacon? The deacon is, first and foremost, to serve in the liturgy. It's first a liturgical role. It began in the early church with serving the tables at the agape meals, which were sort of semi-Eucharistic uh, celebrations, if you will. Some had Eucharistic elements, some were just simply gatherings of, of uh, love feasts, if you will. And then it progressed to where the deacons were offering the communion to the faithful, helping, assisting in baptism in the sacraments of the church. What is a deacon allowed to do and not allowed to do? Well, the, the deacons, the canons of the church limit the roles of each office, priest, deacon, bishop. The deacons participate in the liturgy. In fact, they vocalize all of the petitions in the liturgy. Um, that's first and foremost. They proclaim the gospel from the pulpit. That's the second thing that they do. If they have a theological education, they may preach. But that, a special blessing has to be given from the bishop for that, um, for that. In fact, a lay person with a theological education may be given permission to preach, but that's a special blessing from the bishop. So they may do that, but they have to have the blessing from their hierarch. They can distribute communion and anoint the sick, especially the early diaconate was involved in bringing the Eucharist to the sick who are shut-ins. Bringing the Eucharist to the sick who are shut-ins. Very important part of the, the diaconate. What they cannot do is give a blessing. So they, they, they are not ordained to administer the sacraments without the presence of a priest. Okay? They don't consecrate the host. That's why they don't give the andideron. The priest gives the andideron, the holy bread at the end, as a, a sort of andideron, a, a, instead of the gift. So it is like receiving um, a, a blessing. But that blessing, why, can't the, why does the deacon give it? Because we don't uh, typically, um, the, the deacon does not elevate, he elevates the cup and the chalice, but does not touch the holy bread and elevate it. And that's why he doesn't give the bread at the end. It's an indication of a certain limitation of his office. Okay? Just the same way in the military. Certain ranks do certain things, and there's a certain point where you, that's what you don't do. So they don't give the holy bread because they don't elevate the gift at the consecration. They cannot consecrate the Eucharist alone. Once they consecrate the Eucharist, they're... And so we conclude this evening with the church, the first session, the church in the early times, ending with the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Amen.